Hi everyone, my name is Miroslav Fengner. I am from MAN, and I'm also contributing to Java Mission Control project. And here's my friend, Marcus Hirt. He's with Oracle, and he's actually leading this Java Mission Control project. And today we're gonna talk about how simple it is to build any IoT system or robotic system just using the Lego or Raspberry Pi platform. So maybe you do remember last year we introduced the Robo4j framework, which is a very light framework which allows you to access the hardware and you staying still on Java ecosystem. The Robo4j framework is separated into the modules and you can use them sep separated in order to test your hardware, if it works or not. <laughs> it's a pure Java and this year, we've been pretty busy by a lot of other stuff and project, but a part of it, we put our effort in improving the user experience in building IoT systems or robotic systems. And also, we put our effort to bringing here some new features you will see later. One of those are is networking, and Marcus will gonna talk about it. So last year, we also won the Duke Choice Award. We would like to thank you. And hey, Marcus, how are you gonna feel about giving our audience the introduction to Rubo4j framework basics? It's this now? Yeah, it's me now, I think. Okay, um, cool. So this is typically what your robot would look like if you're building one using Rubo4j. You would have your robot. It would have some dependencies. It can have dependencies on uh, different modules, uh, so the thing is, you don't need to take all of the framework. <clears throat> so we have a bunch of hardware abstractions, for, for example, for Raspberry Pi and for Legos. So if you just want to have like a Java device driver for accessing your hardware, well, that's you know, what you would do. You would take this Robo4j-HW and you know, <clears throat> the, the platform you, you want to support. But then there is the Robo4j core, which lifts this up one more level of abstraction. So you get these agents uh, that you can send messages to. And there are pre-configured agents for various types of hardware. So uh, you might have an LCD. Well, the LCD might have a one, one such agent and you can send LCD messages to it. <clears throat> so we're gonna show you some, some of this, this later. And then of course, these units are also hardware dependent. So that's what you're seeing here. And you might also want to be able to access them over HTTP. And, and then you would use the Robo4j HTTP unit for that. So as I said, there are simple to use hardware abstractions, uh, for example, for Raspberry Pi, uh, that you can use standalone without buying into any other parts of the framework. So here's an example of how that might work. We have an Adafruit LCD. So Adafruit is a company here in the US that is producing uh, you know, simple to use uh, uh, hardware units that you can play around with and lab with. Um, so this is an Adafruit LCD, and then you create it, and then you can just use the Java API to set the backlight color of it, and then set the text uh, using this Robo4j abstraction. Robo4j core defines the core abstractions. So we have a Robo Builder that you can use to build up your Robo system, either programmatically or by using XML. And that will produce a Robo context, which is basically your system. And this context uh, contains a bunch of references to robo units, and those robo units are the agents that you can send messages. And there's also some annotations that you can use to change on you know, how these messages are being delivered. So there's a critical section trait, for example, that you can use to make sure that only one message is sent at any given time, and you know, things like that. Also, define which queue you deliver the messages on. Then we provide some network services like auto discoveries of robots and uh, some remote message and everything is in plain old Java. The hardware specific units uh, are prepackaged configurable units that you just define using a very simple uh, configuration uh, interface or, or, or XML. So you can do that programmatically or through XML. This is the threading model for Robo4j. So we have uh, typically three different uh, thread pools. 
one being the system scheduler and if you don't say anything this is where the messages will be deliver delivered but we assume that you will take care of business fairly quickly then there is a work pool and if you're going to be on cpu a lot then this is the you know where you would like your messages to, to end up up and then there is a blocked one so if you do blocking io this is where you would typically make sure that that your agent is being getting its messages delivered. And for the Raspberry Pi, this is the default configuration, but of course you can do whatever you want there. <clears throat> so when you do a typical Robo4j project, you would add the units for your hardware that you have to your configuration. So if you have an Adafruit LCD unit, that's you know what you would put in your XML. And then you would add your own units for defining the, the controlling behavior. So, so what should happen when, when buttons are pressed and, you know, you get signals from, from various pieces of hardware. And then you would add a main class uh, where you initialize everything through this robo builder and uh, just run that main method. <clears throat> so here's an example of how that might look. We have a main method, uh, we get ourselves a builder and, and we get the definition from this robo for jxml um, file, just an XML file. Then we build our system, and then we start it. And you know that's all you need, basically. In this case, we also get a reference to the LCD and set a message on it. So we send an LCD message to it. Uh, but yeah, that's that's it. So here is an example of an XML, uh, Robo4j XML. So we have an LCD unit, which is an Adafruit LCD unit, and you can see that you have the uh, I2C bus and address defined there, so it can find it if you change that. Perhaps you can also see that there is a button unit on the same unit, so the same hardware address. So it's actually the same piece of hardware <laughs> that that you address, but it's being considered as two different units because you want to handle them differently. And then we have our own little controller implementation that that we use to to define what's happening. So that unit is the target of the button unit. As you can see, we have you know the ID controller is being being sent everything, all the button presses, basically. Okay, the controller itself is simple. Um, if you have a robo unit, you need to implement the own message. Um, so you need to have message handler. In this case, we're getting add a button enum, enums, so we're getting the button presses. And if we have a demo running, uh, if we don't have a demo running, we want to process the message, otherwise we just skip them. So if we're running a demo, we don't want to get interrupted. And <clears throat> the processing of messages is basically, if we press down, we move to the next demo. If we press up, we move to the previous demo. If we select, we, we, we run the demo. So here is um, the demo. <laughs> this is the simplest thing you can do. Okay, maybe here. Yeah. That's, okay, I'm gonna see. Yeah. So um, this is the, the simplest example you could do. You have an LCD here, 3D printed enclosure designed by yours truly, and then I'm gonna run the backlight demo because the scroller you won't see, I think. So we're changing the backlight of the LCD, and yes, so that's a demo uh, <laughs> being controlled by Java. So, and you know, this is very simple. I'm gonna run the scroller because scrollers are cool. <laughs> okay, so a scroller. Anyways, this is the very simplest demo that you can do with, with So, the robotic arm then. Okay, so we brought the other demo here. Uh, you may remember KUKA or IBS or this company, they are just doing this super cool robotic arms in order to build their products. Oh, it's not KUKA, this one. But it's fully Raspberry Pi, uh, fully Raspberry Pi powered stuff and you can control it, hopefully. Yeah, still. You can see that I can do the movements. And as you see from the diagram, I haven't done much. So the controller is handling the collection of servers that are connected with your Raspberry Pi. And also I'm using external input. It's a, this joystick, which I have connected to Raspberry Pi. And I'm controlling all this stuff just by a clicking and the button. So it's pretty cool. I, I get impressed to to playing with with this. I had actually maybe maybe 
Yeah, okay, it's moving also like this. So I had also prepared a gripper to, in order to show you how it may be handle the beer when you are having a hard time by coding so it can serve you the beer. But actually, I haven't found one screw. So that's, this allow me to bring a gripper here. But yeah, next time. So sorry for that. So you haven't seen the beer on the show. So right now we're gonna touch the really rocking feature we've been lately working on, and Marcus gives you the instruction. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, this year, uh, Miro got a son. Uh, I have two toddlers, so um, the actual default implementation of this networking sucks, but it, it works. So, uh, anyways, we have auto discovery of of um, um, robotic units. So you can configure the robotic system in the XML to be auto-discoverable, and it will send broadcast, um, well, actually multicast information about the robotic system, and, and then uh, the discovered systems can be accessed through a remote context. So you will see a robot context just the same as if it's local, and you can you know, send messages to it. So this is how you would enable it. You specify in the robotic systems um, XML that you want to have discovery. You d define the multicast address, the port, the heartbeat interval. Of course, you don't need to specify all of this because uh, these are the defaults, but if you want to do something different. And then you can provide as much metadata that you want uh, so that you can you know, send the right messages to the right robots. So here's an example of how to do that remote messages. You have a lookup service. You get the default lookup service. Um, you get a, a context, and this time through ID. Then you have a reference to it, and then you can just send messages like we did with the LCD example, for example. It's, it's very simple. And of course, you can also do lookups by metadata. So in this case, we get all the discovered context, we stream them, we filter them on only the contexts that our robotic overlords are the ones that we want in this case. And you know, a robotic overlord is, is just us having the metadata is robotic overlord. And then we can send you know, messages like subjugate humanity or whatever it is you know, want to do. OK, so the button presser demo. So this uh, is kind of a funny story. So um, <laughs> you might know Oleg uh, Silachev, um, Oracle Labs, um, Graal person right now. Well, we talked about uh, Robo4j a while back, and he said that the only thing I would wish for is to have something that can press a button. And I was like, I just showed you an autonomous, uh, autonomous robotic vehicle, and you want me to be, build something that presses a button. And he said, yes, yes, that is the killer application for me. Please build one. And I said, well, you know, are you going to sacrifice a Raspberry Pi Zero with 512 megs of memory for pressing a button? And he said, yes, yes, that's exactly what I want. So we built them, and, and you know, yeah. we're going to demo them, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right now we need to switch the screen into my... Oh. Hello. Hello. Switch. <laughs> Please. I will do the call. Other screen. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so we also built up the JavaFX application. It's a JavaFX. But it, it is actually the robot, robot, Robo4j context, which is operating behind the JavaFX. But he is broadcasting the messages, what we do. It's automatically discovered, so you simply plug this button pusher to make your copy into your network, and it will be automatically discovered by Robo4j and then you can enjoy your coffee experience and button pressing experience. And you can do on different one as much as you want so many times. You can have a whole swarm yeah. of them. You can have things. Yeah, exactly. It's like a machinery of button pushing. So you can it's the all greatest button, button pressing experience ever. <laughs> OK. Uh, so silly. Okay. Um, we switch the screen back again. So Mir is going to talk a little bit about the HTTP communication. Okay. So HTTP module, it allows you when you build up some IoT system or robotics one, it's pretty nice to have the communication over HTTP socket. So in 
order to offer you this, we build up the HTTP module. This module is complete in a NIO implementation. It offers you two basic classes. One is a HTTP server unit and one is a client unit. In order that you would like to get information into your system or you would like to send some information out of your system. It communicates with JSON type of message. And we have inside of Verbo4j implemented some basic codecs that you can use. Basically, get the value and so on. In order that you would like to implement your own codecs, you are free to use those three annotations which are on the bottom of the slide. One is HTTP producer, which force you to implement encoding and decoding process itself. And if you would like to only encoding and decoding, use the two REST annotation for this. So the communication style, we use the REST style with communication. So when you add the HTTP server unit into your system and you just run it up, it will automatically access, uh, allow you to access the system on IP address you choose on the port where the server is started and it gives you the, some information about what is running inside and which states are this, I will show you later. When you would like to post anything into the system, just you use the same IP address and port slash units and you can access any unit you have inside a system by just sending the information there in a post. It's a JSON. How it looks, you have, we have one system, just an example, on 8025 port open. So I request what is inside and he gives me information. I have implemented two units. One is HTTP server, he stopped. And, but it's not possible. And right now, we, who gives me a response back? So it was kind of a joke I tried that, but I'm not good at it. So in order, you get all information which kind of units are started, and you get a UID which is automatically generated for you. And this UID of your system must be unique inside of network in order that you can use our networking feature and so on. When you would like to do a post, so as I said, you access on a slash unit on a path controller, and I will send him small push message in a JSON format. We have implemented some error codes, which is a standard one, that you get back which something is not implemented on wrong message types and so on, that you are immediately informed what is actually happening. May I ask for switching the screen to my laptop? One more. I will show you how it looks. Okay. Okay. So here I have my favorite postman. Well, it's not favorite, but it works. And you see, so button pusher demo automatically communi communicates with me. So I can build up by using a JavaScript, whatever, some GUI, and I can talk to my robotic system over this GUI. So this is for what is HTTP unit is. So can we, can we switch back? So, right now we have brought some more interesting demos, maybe. It's a video streaming demo. So in order to get it, or image streaming. So you don't have to do much with Robo4j. This is an example for image streaming demo. You see you have only two units. And basically what you need to do is to define where the images should be sent the port, who will consume those images. And you will run it on your Raspberry Pi, in our case, and he will be keep sending the images on, on your defined endpoint. In video case, it's exactly the same. So you don't have to do much. You just ne need to define who will absorb the stream you are generating. Can I ask for switching the screen again? Okay, so hello. Oh, let's see how it looks. So we have again prepared some some JavaFX application. I need to find my I need to find my mouse. So here we go, and you can see 
the audience, you can see yourself. So it's not, it's not a fake. So it actually works. And Robo4j gives you just the access to the image. And you can shift the result of absorbed image to the different unit where you can implement some fancy algorithms like, let's wait for a while, maybe, maybe the camera works, uh, like uh, edge detection algorithms or just uh, live streaming algorithms. I don't know why the camera doesn't work. Uh, let, me, let me check the stream briefly. Okay, so it, it, it looks like it has a delay somehow. Uh, oh. Well, it, it's doing something, so I will show you the later. So what is interesting on this demo is that uh, we, the, the ho how it is built, there is a one Robo4j context, but anytime you are just closing this, uh, this uh, option in order to get the new image, the new video endpoints is created. So that means he will build up at runtime the new Robo4j units for you. So this is pretty nice because it's using our improved builder feature that you can buy so many server and open so many sockets as you want. So right now, uh, can you switch to my, uh, can, to my other support? Okay, that was a video streaming demo. It worked. Thank you. And right now we said that uh, we have implementation for Lego hardware for Robo4j. In order, to use the Lego, we have written all the abstraction for all available hardware used by Lego. And you can create some fancy robot like we do have here. So I'm, I'm running him. And as Marcus said, and I said, so this hardware units and units they can be used separately. The hardware in order to test your hardware, the units module contains the basic implementation, for example, for tank platform or vehicle platform, and it allows you to very fastly create such, such kind of systems that will work. And this robot, what he does, he basically moving around, and you can, you can change the speed of the robot, and I will show you on the button how he, oh, maybe I will change the speed a little bit and go here to show you. Okay. So I can, I can, I can stop him and make him work again. So, and he will be still running. So here's some kind of autonomous obstacle avoid algorithm implemented. It's very fast to create. Uh, right now, this is how the context looks like, and you have seen already the demo. And right now, we are coming to more advanced system we can build with the Robo4j. Okay, so a um, couple of years ago, I built this uh, robot thing because I discovered that you can now buy laser range finders for 100 bucks. And this, so I put a laser range finder on a couple of servos, and then I start to scan away. And <clears throat> so I 3D printed this thing, um, and it's built out of Makeblock and Polula engines and some Adafruit hardware and well, some other hardware. So uh, this is uh, some of the, the prototypes and uh, some of the 3D printed parts in him. And uh, you know, if you haven't tried out 3D printing yet, you, you're missing out because this is awesome, this is great. Um, it takes some time though to print things, 
So the canopy, I think, took about 24 hours to print. <laughs> so it's not fast, but you know, you can get things to be exactly how you want them. Uh, it's awesome fun. Right, so here he is uh, at uh, Java 1 2016, running in fully autonomous mode. Uh, he's looking at his environment, scanning away, and of course he's blinged. And of course he's called Coffee because, you know, well, he looks like Wally a little bit. Uh, and he's running Java, so there wasn't really a naming choice here. Um, anyways, so he's scanning, and you'll see that he gets closer to stuff. He's going to start thinking about his options a little bit, and, you know, He's dynamically changing his pace depending on how, 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 how things, <laughs> how sure he is of where you want to go, and then he just goes, goes off. So the thing is, um, most of coffee is defined just using uh, these XML um, agents or you know, the robo units. So off the shelf units that just declare where they are available. And um, um, uh, this configuration image is, is, is supposed to be kind of reassuring and not horrible, horribly scaring because, you know, these are mostly off the shelf things. Then there are a few controllers in there that control the behavior and sort of orchestrate how the messages are, are being passed, pass, passed around. But, you know, you just take the stuff you want, you, you define the units that you want to use and, and then you're good to go. Off to the races. <coughs> So if you want to build your own coffee, I put it on Thingiverse. Um, have a lot of other things on Thingiverse. Um, and and um, uh, the repo for, for Robo4j is, is also up there. OK, so we did some other things. We built some tools that I'm going to show. So the coffee, the, the feature extraction algorithms and everything was built basically done on my laptop. So I had coffee run through the apartment um, with a very simple uh, obstacle avoidance algorithm and just scanning. And then I built a plugin for, oops, then I built a plugin for Java Mission Control. So what I did was I basically just um, s took all the data points that I collected, recorded it with flight recorder on ARM, because, you know, flight recorder is pretty darn fast and, and, and uh, with very little overhead. So if you have something timing sensitive, flight recorder is a good idea to use. So that's what I used. And then I, let's see, examples. Then I did a recording of him. And this is the actual recording, if I remember correctly, that I used. So here we go. Um, build simple visualization. Let's move that away from here. Here are the scans of my apartment. And then I started to just hack away actually in the plugin for mission control. <laughs> so I started doing things like, yeah, I want to do feature extraction. I want to find the walls and, and I want to find the corners and I want to do like, maybe I should recast my way out of finding where I want to go. And you know, so I didn't even run the robot anymore. I had, you know, some, some real world data that I could experiment with for different designing the algorithms. So, you know, flight recorder is a cool thing. Um, if you haven't used it, you should probably try. Okay, so that's one example. Then another example is if you have a magnetometer, then you probably know that there is going to be some hard and soft uh, iron effects that you will need to, have to, to compensate for. And um, I'm going to show you here, start with simulated data. So, oops, not sure why that guy is sticking around. Okay, so here we have, um, so basically, um, if you have iron around, um, and if you have magnetic magnets, you know, electric engines, DC engines, for example, you're going to have both a translation effect of the magnetic field, and you're also going to have a morphing effect. It's going to be more of an ellipsoid than a sphere. And what you want in the end is, of course, a perfect sphere. So you need to find out how to morph that thing into a perfect sphere. And this is, you know, the, the, the bias vector and the transform matrix you need to feed to our uh, magnetometer um, implementation so that these tr this transform will happen when you use the magnetometer. I also have, unfortunately, my, <laughs> my laptop is very old and slow. 
So this is going to be a bit jerky, but um, here is some, some real magnetometer data from my magnetometer and the corrected. Yep. Okay, so cool. Magnetometers. Fun stuff. Uh, okay. So that's some tools. Okay, so to, to, to sum up, robots are fun. And, and if you haven't tried building one, it's, it's actually much easier than, than you'd think. And if you use Java and use Robo4j, there are some, um, I mean, of course, you know, you have, a, you have managed memory and you have a platform uh, with, with a lot of uh, libraries that you can use. So, so, of course, that is good. But also, the JVM itself has flight recorder and some other features that makes it really easy to capture uh, runtime data, for example. Um, so, we just got started with this. Uh, I mean, <laughs> last year was pretty much a no op <laughs> because of him having a baby, me having toddlers, and six talks at this Java one, etc. But um, so, so, so it's not like uh, we've had that much time to spend on the framework uh, this year. But hopefully what we've done so far is going to help someone get started with this. Ed, please give us feedback. Uh, also build a robot. <laughs> you will not regret building a robot. No. Can you, s can you switch n one more to my screen? I'm sorry for that. OK. So yeah, build a robot. And what also Robo4j allows you to do is we have here the simple edge detection algorithm running here at the runtime with the camera stuff. You see the edges, it's not a fake because <laughs> maybe there will be our face very soon. It's very slow. Oh, so you can have a lot of fun with this. So you can prototype your robots you can prototype your stuff, and you can free to go with Robo4j. Okay, okay. Let's switch, switch back. Slide. Okay, so for some more information, you can go to Robo4j.io. Uh, uh, the, the Twitter handle, the official one, is Robo4j. And I'm hurt on Twitter. Uh, Miro uh, is Mirage Miko. And uh, yeah, that's, that's basically, basically yes. what we wanted to talk about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, what? Yeah. Yeah. So. Exactly. So I was asking if, uh, if, 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 if the, s the scanned data that I was showing from, from the laser range finder was provided by Flight Recorder, and that is correct. I recorded everything using Flight Recorder. So the thing is, when you record data into the Flight Recorder, you can decide uh, what you want. So the user of the events are at liberty to, do, to select what should be recorded in terms of thread information, in terms of capturing stack traces. And I don't need any of that when I record this data, which makes it extremely inexpensive. Um, on, 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 a, on a machine that I tried it out, not the Raspberry Pi, I mean, it's in order of nanoseconds to, to, to capture an event. So um, yeah, I just recorded the sample points. And then I had a, an aggregated scan ID to, you know, get all, this, all, all the sample points uh, have, to have something to relate them to. Yep. Right, so the visualization for that was, was done using Mission Control, which is also open source now. So I basically built a simple plugin for, for Mission Control that I could use for, for, for visualizing the flight recorder information. Yep, you're welcome. Also, I think I should mention that for Mission Control, um, Mission Control is both a UI and it's also a set of libraries that uh, will be published. They are already available on Maven Central as snapshot builds. So you can have dependencies, Maven dependencies on them, and use them to parse flight recordings, to, to uh, do statistical uh, aggregations over flight recordings, doing automated analysis of flight recordings. Uh, there is even, yeah, I, I, 
I should shut up now. But there is a lot of <laughs> there is a lot of cool things you can do with that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? No. <laughs> he gentleman was correcting his glasses. I thought that was a question. No. Thank you. Okay. Almost. So once again, thank you.